let's put it as two different sessions, two different parts. The first part being undifferentiated uh, systemic rheumatic disease or undifferentiated connective tissue disease, USRD or UCTD. And uh, all of us, when we sit in our OPDs, we come across patients who have maybe uh, just a Raynaud's phenomenon alone, or may have an arthritis, particularly polyarthritis, uh, which we are not able to put in a diagnosis to, like a rheumatoid arthritis. Or you might come across patients who have some skin rash uh, resembling what we have seen in some rheumatic diseases. And uh, often if you biopsy the, these lesions, uh, we may find an interface dermatitis, that is, you know, inflammation, lymphocytic infiltration or inflammation between the dermis and the epidermis and uh, suggesting an immune mediated process. Or you can have, uh, this, despite thorough history and examination, they have multiple clinical or serological abnormalities which does not fulfill any of the established criteria of any specific rheumatic diseases. Uh, so they may have some manifestations of an inflammatory myopathy or lupus or systemic sclerosis or Sjogren's or we know it as an inflammatory arthritis or some serositis, vasculitis or lung inflammation, but doesn't fulfill any of the criteria of a known autoimmune rheumatic disease. Or there might be another group of patients who come just with respiratory symptoms, cough or breathlessness, and we are able to make a diagnosis of interstitial lung disease, but not uh, uh, beyond that. So these are situations which we encounter in a practice, day-to-day -day practice, general medicine or rheumatology practice. So either a Raynaud's alone or arthritis alone or skin manifestations alone, or a combination of any of these things which are not able to label as in any particular autoimmune rheumatic disease or lung inflammation. So these, we could call it as uh, undifferentiated connective tissue disease or UCTD. What I'll try to do is I'll just go through a few patients uh, we typically see in our OPD, uh, which we could look into. So this is about Pinky Kumari, who was 25. And she had some symptoms suggestive of a triphasic Raynaud's with typical cyanosis, uh, ischemia or reduced blood loss, and uh, redness or rubber. And uh, she did not have any other manifestations of a systemic autoimmune rheumatic disease. And uh, so what do we do with her? History-wise, there is nothing else suggested. But one thing we know, uh, if these Raynaud's, if you take all Raynaud's together, like primary and Otherwise, one third of them evolve into a connective tissue disease or undifferentiated connective tissue disease. And there is one study in Journal of Rheumatology 2010, which gives some clue. If you say that there is, this is one, just one series, which says that if you have a thumb involvement in Raynaud's, the chances are that this uh, patient has more likely has a secondary Raynaud's, that is secondary to a connective tissue disease than a primary Raynaud's. So what would you do with this patient? Obviously, we need to differentiate whether it's a primary Raynaud's and a secondary Raynaud's in one of the first investigations, other than the routine investigations, first investigation, we try to do an a &E. So what, what about uh, doing an a &E? And this is a, how, how does it help in establishing a diagnosis? This is a study uh, which, uh, is, is in 2000, published in 1996, actually. They had about 1,000 odd patients with the Raynaud's phenomenon, of which about 129 were positive for a &E. And of these 1,000 odd patients, about 800 did not have any other systemic rheumatic disease manifestations. And despite having no other manifestations, 129 of them were ANA positive. And of this 129, only about 22% or one-fifth, so about 25, uh, developed as autoimmune rheumatic disease on follow-up for about three years. So just saying that, you know, with Raynaud's, uh, ANA positivity may not mean that the patient has an uh, autoimmune rheumatic disease or is evolving into a connective tissue disease. 
but there are some autoantibodies which may be helpful in this context of Raynaud's. If you have a anti centromere antibody, then the chances of this patient developing a limited systemic sclerosis or Crest syndrome is high. This is a study from uh, Annals of Rheumatic Disease 1988. It's an old paper, but still, uh, if you have Raynaud's phenomenon and you do an anti centromere antibody, uh, it has a 60% sensitivity of picking up uh, limited systemic sclerosis or Crest syndrome and with as high specificity. So if you get an anti-centromere antibody positive, the chances are high that the patient can go in for a Crest. And our population, we generally don't see much of Crest, we just see limited systemic sclerosis. So what do we do with Pinky Kumari? Uh, so after ANA was negative, uh, her anti-centromere was negative, so we did a uh, nail fold capillaroscopy. This is a background about nail fold capillaroscopy. This is a study published in 20, 2006, where there are about 1,000 plus patients, uh, consecutive patients with Raynaud's phenomenon, had a, uh, of which about 300 had neither serological findings or clinical signs or symptoms of another connective tissue disease. Uh, so for these patients, these 308 patients, they had a nail fold video capilloscopy done. And uh, then these patients with uh, suspicious these uh, nail fold capilloscopy done were followed up. And of which 133, so that's 133 of 308 patients developed a connective tissue disease at the mean time of uh, six point, sorry, maybe just correcting my numbers. So 133 patients had a follow-up data available of which 109 developed a connective tissue disease at the end of 6.5 years, pinpointing the importance of a nail fold capillaroscopy. And 24 patients, again, uh, who did not have any clinical signs or CTD markers, after 8.5 years, 8.5 years developed a uh, CTD. And these abnormalities on nail fold capillaroscopy could be finding giant capillaries, or avascular fields on the capillaroscopy or irregular architecture of the nail fold capillaroscopies, which are predictive of development of a connective tissue disease in future. Uh, so this is, uh, so about the importance of uh, nail fold capillaroscopy, this is a workshop we have started, a yearly one workshop uh, we do for a nail fold capillaroscopy, you are welcome to attend if you register early and if you have place. And uh, this is some of our pictures which we had in, uh, from our patients. Uh, so this is uh, a normal appearance of a nail fold capillaroscopy. These two are normal appearances. And uh, this is a nail fold capillaroscopy in a patient with uh, lupus who had a UNRNP positivity, which had, uh, these are the giant capillaries you see, and uh, these are the tortuous capillaries you see in, uh, with, with uh, a disorganization. And, uh, we're not going into too much of detail of capilloscopy now, but this is a patient with early scleroderma pattern where there are, uh, you can see the hemorrhages, they're bleeding into the nail fold cap, nail fold, and uh, there are uh, enlarged loops. The loops of the arteries are enlarged, the capillaries are enlarged as well. Yeah, this is again uh, something called an active scleroderma pattern. We have uh, hemorrhages and giant capillaries. And this is another patient with the, the last figure is a psoriatic arthritis, where again you had uh, tortuous capillaries. So that's just showing us the importance of Raynaud's of uh, capillaroscopy. So these could specifically may lead us to a diagnosis of any CTDs, but uh, these are the uh, investigations the way we would evaluate if somebody had a primary Raynaud's other than doing a basic workup for a connective tissue disease like ANA or uh, now, how do you manage her? Uh, obviously, uh, because she had, if she had a capilloscopic change or she was ANA positive or she had centromere changes, it could be uh, a secondary Raynaud's. And, uh, and management of primary Raynaud's other than lifestyle modifications, avoiding uh, cold exposure uh, or protection against cold, stopping smoking and avoiding uh, sympathomimetic ducts. If the patient's condition is generally stable, uh, as we all do, a long-acting calcium channel blockers or 
angiotensin uh, receptor blockers of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors can be used uh, or uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors and uh, there are options of adding uh, ARBs and uh, calcium channel blockers or ARBs and phosphodiesterase inhibitors and statins. If the patient has uh, digital ulcers or the ischemia is severe, the primary, the Raynaud's is severe, uh, in addition to calcium channel blockers, the options include nitrates, aspirin, and uh, uh, prostaglandins, uh, again, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, uh, including uh, tadalafil, or uh, endothelin receptor antagonists like uh, bosentan, uh, ambrisentan, masententan, which are quite effective in treatment of Raynaud's. So, so bottom line is avoiding the precipitating cause, pharmacological therapy, which include calcium channel blockers, ARBs, ACE inhibitors, nitrates, uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, and endothelin receptor antagonists. So coming to the second patient. So this is uh, Radhamani, who is 32, and she came with the symptoms suggestive of a inflammatory polyarthritis. Uh, so obviously when a young lady comes to you with inflammatory polyarthritis without any other associated symptoms other than those related to the joints and the systemic relate symptoms related to the joint inflammation, we try to fit in whether they can fit into a, uh, is it rheumatoid arthritis becomes a first differential diagnosis. And uh, coming to the 2010 ACR, you have classification criteria. Uh, so if they fit into the criteria, obviously it becomes a rheumatoid. Now coming to the sensitivity of ACR ULAR criteria, just to say that, you know, despite uh, with all the best efforts, currently the sensitivity of the 2010 ACR ULAR criteria is only 73%. Uh, and the specificity is also close to that about 74%. Uh, so if you have ACR ULAR criteria positivity, then the likelihood ratio is about 2.85. And if it's, uh, it has a very good negative likelihood ratio of 0.35, they don't, don't fulfill the criteria for uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So just saying that uh, there are a group of rheumatoid arthritis who may not fulfill the criteria. So do all patients with inflammatory arthritis behave similarly? Uh, there, there are some patients who might have a migratory arthritis, which may be symmetrical or asymmetric. Sometimes it might be just an oligoarthritis. Uh, with a, you know, when you come to the OPD, the patient gives a definite convincing evidence of a inflammatory arthritis, but you examine, you may not find a joint swelling per se at that point of time. Or if the patient has prolonged morning stiffness, raised inflammatory markers, or maybe a positive autoimmune markers like RNA or rheumatoid factor, and you give anti-inflammatory medications, there's a good response saying that the whole process is inflammatory. So you know that there is widespread evidence to say that this is an autoimmune process happening, but uh, still they don't fulfill the criteria to diagnose uh, rheumatoid arthritis or any other sort of uh, arthritis predominant diseases like uh, Sjogren's or mixed connective tissue disease. And what happens to these patients? 10% of these patients who present with polyarthritis who does not fulfill criteria for rheumatoid or any other CTD, ultimately they develop down, down the years, about three to five years, 10% will ultimately uh, fulfill the criteria for other systemic rheumatic disease, whether it's lupus or systemic sclerosis or inflammatory myositis or spondyloarthritis. Another five to 10% may acquire other features of uh, connective tissue disease like maybe Raynaud's, maybe skin manifestations or maybe lung manifestations, but still we can't label them as a specific rheumatic disease. So this is uh, so another group of patients who would label it as UCTD. And so the first we spoke about Pinky Kumari who presented with Raynaud's. Second, we spoke about Radhamani who came with uh, inflammatory polyarthritis. Uh, not fulfilling criteria for rheumatoid. So what happens to these, uh, this is a study in uh, uh, clinical ex and experimental rheumatology 2019. Does early seronegative arthritis progress to RA? 
This is a 10 year observation study of about 1000 odd patients, uh, of which uh, who didn't fulfill criteria for RA, but uh, and 435 of them were uh, zero negative. 3% of these uh, 435 evolved into a zero positive erosive RA. 16% developed polymyalgia rheumatica. 11% went on to develop psoriatic arthritis. 10 of them just had osteoarthritis. 9% had spondyloarthritis. 3% reactive arthritis. 2% gout. 4% pseudo gout. 1% one, one had a paraneoplastic arthritis. 1% of them were actually juvenile arthritis and other rare causes like uh, hemochromatosis or even angspond or GCA. So the saying that you may have a hidden underlying systemic connective tissue disease in this group of patients. So what happens if you, uh, so she doesn't fulfill criteria for rheumatoid, shall we just keep observing her? So this is a study which published in uh, Arthritis Care and Research uh, in 2018. If you treat these patients, if Radhamani is treated with uh, medications, immun immunomodulation, there's a lower rate. The odds ratio of she not progressing into rheumatoid is uh, 0.49. So you treat, uh, treat her and the chances of her developing, progressing into a, a CTD or including a rheumatoid arthritis is has an odds ratio of 0.49. So that's the reason she has to be treated. And, uh, and so with any treatment, it's 0.49. Or if you specifically treat Radhamani with methotrexate, the odds ratio of her developing rheumatoid at one year is uh, 0.13. So how do we go forwards with her? So we need to sort of, because of that, the chances of her developing into a rheumatoid is less if she's treated, more so if she's treated with uh, methotrexate. And this choice of methotrexate or another disease modifying drugs depends on many individual reasons for that patient, including plans, planning of pregnancy, convenience, uh, drug compliance, pill burden, all those things. So how do we go ahead with, go forwards with her? We had two options. One is doing a musculoskeletal ultrasound or an MRI. So which could identify synovitis, bone edema or erosions prior to what we could pick up on uh, X-ray. And uh, so this is something which is not clinically picked up, but uh, would be picked up on uh, more sensitive imaging. So this is uh, an ultrasound scan of these patients with the Doppler, Doppler basically showing the increased vascularity of the tissues, including the synovium, uh, which uh, obviously shows uh, effusion, and the Doppler saying there is a panis formation or new vascular new vascularization happening with different grades is given there. And if you can see in the star mark there, that's one uh, erosion which is seen in the periarticular bone, which is suggestive of a erosive arthritis, which would have otherwise been missed. Now, what more? Uh, the extremity MRI, the low field extremity MRI, that's a 0.5 or below Tesla MRI which is uh, more sensitive to pick up changes in the smaller joints, particularly the hands, feet, or even the elbow and the knee, uh, could pick up, identify changes like erosions. This is the first one is the uh, coronal and the second, the axial images of the wrist and metacarpophalangeal joints, which obviously shows some erosive changes at the wrist and uh, synovitis at the metacarpophalangeal joints, which would have otherwise been missed with, uh, without, without an MRI. So as we all obviously would think, when you have a inflammatory polyarthritis, uh, an erosive inflammatory arthritis like in rheumatoid is one of your uh, major considerations. So getting to know whether the disease is erosive or not helps us to label whether it's uh, rheumatoid or mixed connective tissue disease, that helps. Another common cause for this polyarthralgia is uh, Sjogren's. And again, uh, if the patient has Zika symptoms, has antibody positivity, then you would have labeled it as Sjogren's. But what we're trying to do is in this sort of patients who has some connective tissue symptoms, 
to improve the diagnostic yield, a salivary gland ultrasound really helps. And for the diagnosis of Sjogren's, the ultrasound has a sensitivity of about 65%, uh, and but if you find changes, it has a specificity of about 96%. So this is a no this is how a normal parotid gland will look out, look like on ultrasound, or that matter any other salivary gland. But uh, parotid is so easy to do. It's just you keep a probe and you see this is exactly what you see, and uh, this is what you see in uh, Sjogren's. So there are different gradings of uh, the parotid gland findings in Sjogren's. I'm not going to that, including the changes in the uh, covering of the saliva, uh, gland to what happens to the parenchyma. So th th this is again, this, uh, this, da this data is from this uh, paper published in uh, Oxford Rheumatology uh, for Sjogren's in undifferentiated connective tissue disease. So now how do we treat Radhamani? So obviously, the treatment has to be pitched in based on the severity of the disease. We try to label it in a particular diagnosis, but if she couldn't fit into any of the specific connective tissue disease, you put her as a label of undifferentiated connective tissue disease, presenting as inflammatory arthritis. And treatment options include, uh, other than NSAIDs and steroids for a... Uh, is there any question or... Yeah, so other uh, DMARCs, which includes uh, methotrexate, sulfasalazine, uh, leflunamide, hydroxychloroquine. There are even options of going for biologicals or small molecules like Janus kinase inhibitors, biologicals like rituximab or uh, tozolizumab, if you have difficulty managing the arthritis with con conventional synthetic DMARCs. So that's the second uh, group of patients. Now the third group, there are a group of patients who come with uh, cutaneous manifestations. This is a study which is published in Journal of Rheumatology 2007. Uh, so they looked at patients, this study specifically looked at patients coming with, uh, uh, they looked at patients with, had a label of UCTD and had associated anti-thyroid antibodies. And the associated skin lesions 47 of the 526 had skin manifestations, which included uh, erythematous macules, patches, uh, papules uh, with scaling. So these are different manifestations you see. And 15 of the 47 had a biopsy done, which showed either a mild lymphocytic dermatitis or a superficial perivascular infiltrates, or they were patients with patchy dermal mucin and occasionally lymphocytic vasculopathy, all suggesting an underlying inflammatory process, which is uh, um, immune mediated. So that's the third group of patients coming with cutaneous manifestations. Fourth is uh, inflammation in the lungs, that's ILD or idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. And uh, generally we know like in patients with uh, uh, systemic rheumatic disease, non-specific interstitial pneumonitis or NSIP is commonly found in patients with Sjogren's, lupus, systemic sclerosis and inflammatory myositis. Uh, while UIP is much more commoner in, uh, as a presentation of ILD, usual interstitial pneumonia uh, as a manifestation of ILD in rheumatoid arthritis. These are known facts about patients with established autoimmune rheumatic diseases. So, uh, but it's not an all or none law. You can have a few RA patients who have an NSIP, or you can have few lupus or systemic sclerosis patients who have UIP changes also. But generally, this is how the pattern follows. And uh, as we all know, the NIC pattern, uh, NSIP pattern, we have a ground glass predominant, which is uh, which is the most significant, important finding, with uh, <coughs> or sometimes it may be the small uh, sole finding, and. Uh, it may not be as obvious as in these picture films, but uh, may be subtle also. And in addition, you could see irregular lines or reticular shadowing, about another 50% of cases with some traction bronchi cases. You can have uh, honeycombing, which is relatively infrequent, and uh, generally they are bilaterally symmetrical. Or you can have changes in UIP, which basically has a reticular abnormality, which is predominant, and uh, honeycombing, Traction bronchitis may or may not be there, and it has a subplural uh, basal predominance. And uh, they, generally, you don't find 
ground glassing or nodules when you have a UIP criteria. So as you would know, in earlier days, this uh, differentiation of uh, lung inflammation into NSAIP and UIP were based on a histopathology. But now, th with the advances and improvement in expertise in interpretation of radiology, the uh, it is NSIP or UIP is a basically a radiological diagnosis rather than a biopsy diagnosis. And only an odd patient who may need a biopsy to establish the diagnosis. Uh, so this is a group of patients. Uh, this is a paper in uh, American Journal of Respiratory and Clit Critical Care Medicine where uh, idiopathic NSIP lung manifestation, whether it's a lung manifestation of UCTD. Uh, so they had uh, 28 patients who had some clinical feature of a uh, connective tissue disease along with the ILD. And they were a control group. They had 47 patients without any uh, connective tissue disease features. So now coming to the uh, table, uh, the UCTD group, 83% of the UCTD group had NSIP while uh, only 6% had UIP and 6% had other sorts of inflammatory pneumonitis like organizing pneumonia or some fibrosis which couldn't be classified. Now coming to the control group where they did not have any features of connective tissue disease, only 9% had NSIP while 86% had UIP. So basically meaning uh, NSIP, whether it's active alveolitis, active inflammatory process going on is a component of, is, is, is a, could be an important component of UCTD. And uh, whereas uh, if you don't have any CTD features, there are more of fibrotic lung disease like a UIP. Again, stressing the importance and as, as they experience with other connective tissue disease say, treating NSIP is so important and worthwhile pursuing and treating, unlike uh, UIP, which may not so well respond to treatment. Um, so the need for further evaluation and management. Now coming to the entity, like you know, where you just have uh, lung manifestations, there's uh, some people use the term lung dominant CTD. Uh, basically, basically have, when you have NSAIP without any extra pulmonary manifestations, uh, or having any other systemic rheumatic disease uh, thing. And histopathology in this group of lung dominant CTD shows diffuse perivascular collagen, uh, aggressive pleuritis, lymphoid aggregates with germinal center formation, and or plasma cell infiltrates. Some of them could have positive serologies like uh, antisynthetase antibodies, SCL70 anti rho or CCP antibodies, but they don't fulfill into that specific rheumatic disease. And uh, even so that's about NSIP and coming to UIP, even in UIP, if the UIP happens to be associated with a rheumatic disease, their survival is much better than if it's, than it's idiopathic, signifying the importance of evaluating these patients with lung disease further for a positive CTD or they have a UCTD with the lung involvement. Now coming to IPAF, this is uh, since 2015. This is a joint task force by uh, ERS, that is European Respiratory Society and American Thoracic Society, uh, where undifferentiated forms of CTD ILD, they put together it as uh, IPAF for interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features. In this group, they put the patients uh, based on three domains, basically a clinical domain, uh, if they had specific extra thoracic features, a serological domain based on the uh, presence of antibodies, autoantibodies, or a morphological domain based on the imaging or histopathology uh, findings on the lung. So based on these findings, those with autoimmune features were put into group of uh, IPAF. Okay, so now once we have uh, established the diagnosis of interstitial lung disease, and you have clear evidence to say that it, there is evidence of autoimmune features either clinically or uh, evaluation wise, including autoantibodies. What are the treatment options? And as I mentioned repeatedly, treating, diagnosing uh, lung inflammation and treating lung inflammation associated with autoimmune disease is really worthwhile. 
And so what are the treatment options? I'm not going to too much in the detail of the treatment options and the outcome of different treatment options because of lack of time, but steroids with uh, doses, starting with doses varying from 0.5 mg per kg to 1 mg per kg, along with combination of different drugs. We commonly use uh, uh, mycophenolate, either mycophenolate morphetal or sodium based on the GI tolerance. Uh, mycophenolate morphetal has a better pharmacokinetics, but uh, mycophenolate sodium is kinder on the gut. Uh, other options include uh, cyclophosphamide. Generally, somebody fails mycophenolate or can't for some reason, either because of uh, financial reason or some reason can't tolerate mycophenolate or can't take mycophenolate, cyclophosphamide is an option. Uh, and if they fail either of the drug, the other one can be used. So that's an option when we use uh, between them. Uh, there's increased evidence of uh, calcineurin inhibitors. Uh, uh, both cyclosporin and tacrolimus, either in combination with mycophenolate or simply in management of uh, ILD. And azoran, previously it was very commonly used, but now uh, mycophenolate and cyclophosphamide on calcium inhibitors have better data on uh, improvement in inflammation than azoran. So rarely uh, people use azoran as a first-line drug, uh, but whether there are, there are issues like uh, planning of pregnancy and all, then Azoran is still an option. Uh, the other option is somebody has failed the previous first-line drugs like mycophenolate, cyclophosphamide, then you have the option of using rituximab, uh, or particularly if you have interstitial lung inflammation with some joint manifestations, which is difficult to treat, uh, then rituximab is an option. As you would know, mycophenolate is, doesn't help in inflammatory arthritis, Cyclophosphamide is not something you would like to use in somebody with inflammatory arthritis. Azuran, because of its effectiveness on lung inflammation. In such sort of a situation, rituximab is a very good option for interstitial lung treatment. But only thing is, data is still evolving. There are some clear indications in uh, case series which say that rituximab helps, but still, so we have patients which we have used rituximab for lung inflammation. Now, actually, uh, why it's so important to pick up these UCTDs. And this is one data which published in Rheumatology 2016. And those patients with UCTD, if they go in for pregnancy, uh, there's a higher risk of having fetal growth restrictions, preeclampsia, or small for gestational age infants compared to uh, matched controls. And so, so it's important to pick up during their uh, pre-pregnancy. And uh, evolution of UCTD in about 10 to 35 percent of patients in three to 10 years of time uh, of the onset of the first autoimmune manifestation, they develop into a uh, definitive rheumatic disease, either lupus, rheumatoid, Sjogren's, MCTD, or scleroderma. And uh, features which may predict evolution to specific disease suppose somebody has anti CCP positivity the chance of them developing rheumatoid is high. Or as I mentioned before, if they have CENP positivity, they have a chance of developing limited systemic sclerosis is high. Or if they have anti-DSDNA or one of the anti-phospholipid antibody like antiocardiolipin or lupus anticoagulant positivity, along with UCTD features, the chances of them developing into uh, lupus is high. Or if they have a CL70, the chances of developing scleroderma is high. So those are fe features even though they don't fulfill criteria for the disease, they may predict evolution into a specific disease. Or similarly, if you have antibodies to SSA, so in the rho and antigen itself, there's a subcomponent of uh, 60 kilodalton. If you have an antibody against a 60 kilodalton subcomponent, the chances are they develop lupus. So that's why we, we developed that test in our lab. So it's available in the rheumatology lab. Or if they develop antibodies to 52, both 52 and 60 Dalton proteins, they have a chance of higher chance of developing Sjogren's, primary Sjogren's. So I'm just limiting it to uh, the evaluation features which help us to predict progression. But uh, progression also depends on many other factors like, you know, if you are, if you have a, of uh, Asian ethnicity, if you are a his, uh, African American, African ancestry, the chance of lupus is high. Or if you have a family history of rheumatoid, the chance of rheumatoid is high. So all those things. Now, having said all that about UCTD, despite all this evaluation and management, 
25% of rheumatic disease patients with systemic symptoms cannot have a definitive diagnosis. And of this, majority of them will remain undiagnosed for, for five to 10 years. Basically uh, saying that, you know, it is better not to label them into uh, particular systemic rheumatic disease if you're not, they're not fulfilling the criteria. Uh, we know that no, no criteria is 100% sensitive or 100% specific. Still, better remain as UCTD and follow, follow them up accordingly rather than labeling them into a particular disease without fulfilling the criteria. So that's about uh, UCTD. And so that's the first half of uh, the session. Uh, don't worry, the second half is not going to be as long, but uh, generally when we say connective tissue disease, we include these six diseases, lupus, scleroderma, uh, polymyositis and dermatomyositis, rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren's. So if you have uh, any of these diseases, you label them as specific disease and just want to tell you about the classification criteria. This is a 2019 uh, ACR ULAR classification criteria for lupus. This is a weighted criteria where, uh, you know, uh, different manifestations have been given different weighted scores. And uh, why I wanted to show this slide is, uh, yeah. With the ACR ULAR criteria, again, uh, the sensitivity is about 96% and specificity of 93. Uh, the previous slick criteria again had the almost same sensitivity, but the specificity was low. And the old ACR criteria, which we used about 15, 20 years back, has a sen low sensitivity, and uh, but specificity was still okay. So that's basically uh, lupus criteria, uh, ACR ULA 2019 criteria for lupus. And uh, this is a 2010 ACR ULA criteria for. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis and uh, where you have uh, four domains where clinical joint involvement serology acute phase reactants and duration of symptoms which all of many of us most of us are familiar with and uh, if you over time if you have a total score greater than six we can classify the patient as rheumatoid but again the this is a almost uh, it's a very in terms of rheumatoid it's a very sensitive criteria but still uh, with different standards, like, you know, treatment response and all, the sensitivity of this criteria also is only about 82%. And the specificity is again, uh, 61%. Uh, so that's about uh, uh, classifying somebody as rheumatoid uh, or limitation of classifying somebody as rheumatoid. Uh, now, this is again a weighted criteria for classific 2013, uh, ACR ULA classification criteria for systemic sclerosis. Uh, Again, if you have a skin tightening or diffuse skin tightening, you have a score of nine and that is enough to make a diagnosis of systemic sclerosis. What are the other features like uh, uh, just a few fingers alone, just sclerodactyly alone, which have different scores. And if you have a fingertip lesions like digital uh, tip ulcers or fingertip pitting scars, then you have uh, different scores. If you have telangiectasia or if you have abnormal nail fold capillaroscopy findings, then you have a score of two, uh, which that is why we used in the first patient. Uh, or if somebody has evidence of uh, pulmonary artery hypertension with or without ILD, you have a score of two. If there is just Raynaud's alone, it's two. Or if you have antibodies, uh, you have a score of three. So basically, uh, 2013 ACIULA classification criteria again has a sensitivity of about 91% in picking up systemic sclerosis and specificity of 92%. Again, uh, 2017 ACR ULAR criteria for primary Sjogren's uh, based on uh, lip biopsy. Uh, so the features include lip biopsy, uh, serology, uh, evidence for dry eyes, evidence for dry mouth. And uh, the total score is maximum score is nine. And if you have a score of four or more, you can di di label them as primary Sjogren's. Again, this has a sensitivity of about 96% and specificity of 95%. And uh, for inflammatory myositis, again, this is a 2017 criteria. There are two groups of uh, uh, conditions in which uh, this has been uh, labeled based on if you have a muscle biopsy or if you don't have a muscle biopsy. And uh, they have been classified into uh, probable, possible, and definite uh, 
inflammatory myositis so if if the probability is below uh, 50% then you call it as if somebody has a probability of less than 50% based on this score then it is called as uh, you rule out uh, inflammatory myositis so probability more than 50% you uh, you label them as one of the th three either possible definite or probable inflammatory myositis so the so based on the score you calculate and your percentage of uh, possibility you put it so if it's more than 90% you call it as uh, uh, definite and if between 55 and 90 you call it as uh, possible uh, so this includes uh, i'm not going through this includes the uh, uh, clinical features histopathology uh, emg findings and uh, autoimmune markers so why i went through all these uh, classification criteria so basically the all these uh, classification criteria has been done to improve the sensitivity of this different criteria because with aggressive treatments available with treatments which could modify the course of the disease could give a better outcome for the patient both and the long term prognosis being becoming better with different treatment options uh, it is important to have tests which are or improving the sensitivity in the diagnosis but you know all of them are immunosuppression or immunomodulation so unless you are specific in the diagnosis that can also lead in trouble lead to trouble so that's why uh, importance of uh, classic cr cr classification criteria in uh, de defining specific autoimmune disease but all said and done the bottom line of all classification criteria is it is for uh, research but not for clinical use but there's for want of better evidence for diagnosing uh, disease in practice many of us use the classification criteria to diagnose systemic autoimmune rheumatic diseases now coming to overlap connective tissue disease so one of these diseases when you have uh, patients fulfill the criteria of more than one you call it an overlap connective tissue disease now coming to the entity of uh, mctd or mixed connective tissue disease this is this is an arguable entity whether it's an overlap connective tissue disease or this is a separate disease in itself but as for our discussion purpose we will take it as an overlap connective tissue disease with overlapping features of lupus scleroderma uh, polymyositis and rheumatoid arthritis and you know you have the alarcon sagovas criteria or cans criteria for diagnosis of mctd which again the sensitivity is poor about 63% and specificity of 86% the quintessential criteria for mctd is the presence of high titer unrnp positivity and then you have the clinical criteria of swollen hands synovitis myositis raynaud's and atherosclerosis so the common essential feature being unrnp positivity and generally people with mctd tend to have less of renal involvement unlike in lupus they have they have a higher chance of developing uh, pulmonary hypertension sometimes even more than scleroderma and uh, they tend to develop an erosive arthritis which are all different from the other ctds so some people argue it to be a separate entity in itself with unrnp positivity or it could be taken as an overlap connective tissue disease also the lupus findings of mctd include arthritis lymphadenopathy facial erythema or uh, cytopenias they can have scleroderma features like sclerodactyly lung involvement or uh, esophageal involvement or they can have a myositis like features like muscle weakness muscle enzymes and uh, muscle inflammation on emg now all mctds need not be of the same severity of the same extent or need not follow the same course so you can have features, clinical features of mctd just with a positive ana which you, maybe you can call it as a milder disease or a level 1 of hierarchy or you can have a high titer ana positivity which is speckle pattern which you generally get in lupus so again it's maybe more severe involvement than uh, level 1 so put it as level 2 or very high titer unrnp positivity you put it as level 3 
and uh, or there are sub components of the UNRNP. You can develop antibody against that, like anti 68 kilodalton protein or anti A antibodies. We have more severe disease, more severe organ involvement. So that's coming about about MCTD. Now coming about rupus. Actually, when you have these overlaps, which is frequent, you know, uh, or with uh, sizable numbers, like you have good number of rheumatoids and uh, SLE overlap patients. So you just put them as a label. So you can call it as rupus because it's one of the common overlaps. And uh, one of the things about rupus is like rheumatoid arthritis lupus is the patients develop these manifestations sequentially. So initially they might present to use like rheumatoid or lupus and with time they go on to develop the other disease features. And this is a lady with uh, lupus, this is x-ray hands of a lupus. And if we wouldn't have told you that it was uh, lupus, the juxtaarticular osteopenia around the MCPs and the PIPs. And uh, if you carefully look at it, there are erosions also and uh, joint space narrowing. These are all features you generally see in rheumatoid arthritis. So this is a uh, rupus patient. Another entity which is uh, of significant number to label as a separate entity is uh, scleroderma, uh, sclerodermatomyositis. Basically an overlap between scleroderma and myositis. And the difference from rupus is in sclerodermatomyositis, they tend to develop the manifestation simultaneously. They de develop the scleroderma features and the inflammatory myositis features at the same sitting. So that is how it is different from rupus. <coughs> other overlap syndromes, you can have scleroderma and rheumatoid arthritis or scleroderma with other CTD overlaps or uh, myositis with all other CTD overlaps or you can have a ju juvenile JIA with lupus overlap or Sjogren's which is probably the commoner overlap with all the other CTDs. So all these overlap features are possible. And uh, this is just an antibody profile of uh, uh, which could differ in overlaps. Uh, and how do we manage the overlaps? So I, di I didn't go take each of these overlap management separately because as we have saw in CTD, uh, undifferentiated connective tissue disease, whichever is the predominant uh, symptom uh, or organ involvement, you manage that, uh, your man treatment is primarily targeted to that involvement. Similarly, in any of these uh, connective tissue disease, like uh, in scleroderma, your lung might be targeted to, towards a pulmonary hypertension or a lung involvement, while in lupus, as you know, it could be against a nephritis, myocarditis, or CNS manifestation, or uh, rheumatoid, it could be against the erosive arthritis, or Sjogren's, it, it could be uh, the glandular involvement or the lung involvement. Uh, Now, again, coming to the management, this is one paper I found it's interesting. This is a paper published in 2011. Actually, for all, whether UCTD or overlaps, UCTD in particular, vitamin D supplementation in, has shown to improve the immunoregulatory function. This is about 21 patients who are supplemented with vitamin D. And as we all know, uh, many of these uh, Connective tissue disease features a high uh, CD4, TH1, and TH17 uh, lymphocyte activity, producing in inflammatory uh, uh, TH1, TH17 cytokines. And uh, vitamin D supplementation is as shown to reduce these TH1 and TH17 cytokine levels. And they also uh, restore the as, you know, T regulatory cells are inhibitory to the active inflammatory process and this vitamin D supple uh, supplementation enhances or restores the functional activity of the T regulatory cells. So which the imbalance which happens between T regulatory T17 or T TH, TH17 or TH1 ratio is tend to be corrected by vitamin D supplementation. Now coming to a summary of what we discussed uh, today, uh, you need to avoid uh, there are many situations you cannot give a, a diagnostic label and uh, unless there is a uh, established criteria. And uh, one of the problems with physicians is, you know, we, we tend to, uh, we find it difficult to tolerate uh, uh, uncertainty. 
So many of the UCTDs is basically uncertain. You, you just can't say that, you know, is this uh, Romich or is this uh, lupus, but that's a, our problem. But uh, if we can overcome that problem and can treat as the uh, patient is, and if the patient can be, we, patient can, we can make the patient understand that, that's one important step towards management of uh, UCTD. And the patients need to be, even for uh, specific CTD also, patients need to be managed expectantly and according to the major clinical and symptomatic feature. I think that's the last slide. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions if they are. If you have any questions, you can put down your doubts in the chat box or you can unmute yourselves and raise your questions also. So one question which came in the group is uh, for UCTD with uh, asymptomatic normal respiratory system, should we do a baseline CT thorax for everyone to rule out an ILD? Not for every patient. So if uh, um, Raynaud's is no? Raynaud's. If somebody uh, comes with Raynaud's and uh, obviously if there are no clinic, other clinical features at all, I would do a CNP. And if clinically the patient does not have any features of uh, respiratory involvement, at the best I would do it is a, a spirometry. Uh, otherwise for Raynaud's alone, it may not be uh, reason to do a, or is not a reason to do an HRCT. Unless uh, you have some other antibody, like so, you 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 had some suspicion, so either you do SCL seventy or uh, or an evaluation for inflammatory arthritis shows an involvement, then you may think of. Otherwise, just for uh, Raynaud's alone, there is no indication to do a, a HRCT. The other one was the uh, UIP spectrum uh, ILD. Usually, they say it's refractory to medical therapy. So, if it's associated with a, another CTD, should be. Uh, the management wise, so steroids with immunosuppression or solely the pulmonary rehabilitation? No, actually, that is a paper I showed. No, uh, UIP, even UIP between uh, connective tissue disease related and uh, idiopathic, they behave differently. Uh, so it is still worthwhile treating, uh, it is worthwhile treating uh, CTD related uh, UIP uh, than not treating. So so that's the that's a paper I showed actually, which shows they behave better, they have a better outcome, and so it is worth treating a UIP related to CTD. But if it's idiopathic, then uh, you may not benefit. Uh, what, uh, another question was uh, management on management MCTD yeah. so on induction followed by maintenance, and during maintenance phase, how long do we continue the immunosuppressives? Uh, see, actually, uh, again, MCTD management has, uh, maybe I would put it as uh, four uh, aspects. One is uh, arthritis management. Arthritis management would be like indefinite, but uh, as in like a rheumatoid, there will be a significant proportion of patients, uh, not significant, a minor about 10 to 20 percent of patients who might go into remission for a significant period of time. Significant, I mean, more than a year or so. Generally, uh, study, uh, people, uh, uh, professional bodies say six months, but a year or so, if they are in remission, you can just try tapering and stopping. Uh, second is uh, lung inflammation. So the duration of treatment of lung inflammation is minimum three to three or five years. And then you keep following up. And now data is evolving, uh, saying that, you know, when you tend to reduce the immunosuppression, they are the people who tend to flare. So actually you can't leave them off follow-up. If you're comfortable enough to pick up an early ILD and an early flare, early uh, change, then maybe three years, three to five years, at least is the duration of treatment. But actually there's no good answer when to stop. That's the bottom line. There's no good answer when to stop. But uh, a few other factors which determine when to stop is, one is, you know, sufficient long period of time, you're followed up and uh, you, you the in remission for a long period of time and uh, always taper, never stop, never, never stop, always taper. And then you may be able to, 
but, uh, but never stop following up. So that's about the uh, lung inflammation. Then pulmonary hypertension, obviously you have to term, it's like an indefinite uh, treatment. Uh, gut manifestations also, it's indefinite treatment. So gut and uh, pulmonary hypertension, indefinite treatment. Lung disease, you may, but or most likely you may not. Uh, arthritis, or you may or may not be able to stop. Uh, one more question. Uh, during follow, uh, patients clinically better and uh, lab parameters, what do we, uh, during follow up, do we ask for? Do we serially monitor the inflammatory markers or uh, the criteria like the UNRMB levels? Is there a role for periodic follow up to look for emission? Actually, once you have a diagnosis, like including MCTD, uh, the follow up is for the organ involvement. Suppose if it's your uh, lung inflammation which you're looking for, then it is a, a six minute walk test, spirometry. Uh, so that's the main way you follow it up or maybe uh, or HRCT, uh, but that's less frequently, more important as this, and maybe two years or three years, or once in two or three years, you do an HRCT, or there, there might be co composite, uh, co composite indices which might be evolving, like antibodies levels, like uh, KL6 anti, KL6 antibodies, which levels which may be useful in future to monitor these things. But bottom line is, uh, uh, be, so monitoring is based on the uh, organ involved. So does it answer the question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, any more doubts? You can we have another two more minutes? So, uh, one more question they've asked is uh, for probable inflammatory arthritis. In early stage, zero negative. Uh, in terms of NSAIDs, which is responding to the to therapy, how long can we use NSAIDs alone? See, actually, one question was uh, you said erosive arthritis. Yes. No? yes. See, er erosive arthritis meaning you know this patient is going in erosion meaning like you know it's the beginning of deformity. Uh, so it is like you know um, maybe I, I would say for some, somebody had an ischemic myocardium. Can you, you know, leave it uh, like that, you know? Uh, you would treat an ischemic myocardium, whatever, you know, despite, you know, uh, it's like that. If there is an erosion, that is a deform, you put it as, you know, that's synonymous to deforming inflammatory arthritis. So you, that just says that you have to be aggressively managing it, or the, it's a question of time the patient get developed, uh, deforming, uh, full form deforming arthritis. But second is NSAIDs. See, uh, the data with NSAIDs is best, uh, people give NSAIDs for long term like months or years, two years, three years and all. And uh, particularly in the context of uh, spondyloarthritis. But our patients in Indian context, actually this is not data driven information, but our patients, uh, the chances of nephrotoxicity, the chances of uh, GI toxicity are much more than Western. So actually personally, uh, first of all, look at all other factors like Somebody over 60, I would really, really doubt, really recheck whether I need an NSAID at all. And uh, somebody below 60, uh, other risk factors like hypertension, diabetes, or some other reason for a renal disease or GI, I'd be really very careful. And somebody has an erosive arthritis, then the treatment is not NSAID. It's like more like a symptomatic treatment. Uh, so treating erosive arthritis as NSAID is a bad option, uh, but it's like more of symptomatic treatment and uh, uh, and another thing is, you know, reality for our situation is if you prescribe an NSA to a patient and the patient knows that it works, uh, then they won't ask you next time, shall I take it? You know, the next time they come with you is like a, a CRF and uh, or a, uh, some papillary necrosis or something is land up there. So I would be very careful before I, if I have established a CTD, uh, NSA, it's symptomatic treatment short term is what I would recommend. But textbooks, it's mostly based on Western population would say they take long term but may not be a good option at all. There are no more questions. We'll wind up the session. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for accepting our request from our medicine department for organizing this lecture series, sir. Uh, and uh, we are very grateful for this elaborate discussion on UCTD and overlap syndrome, sir. And thank you so much, sir. We'll be uploading this session shortly in our YouTube channel in another three days. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. All the best.